Hi, I'm Mike McLean. Welcome to the Short Circuit Podcast, brought to you by Swift Aircraft. In this series, we'll be chatting with a variety of people from all walks of life, but who all have one thing in common, aviation. We'll discuss how and why they got into aviation, what or who inspired them, and what they would say to encourage young people to get involved. Flight fascinates many of us, and our guests will explain why they are compelled to look to the sky. Today's chat is with Stephen Breslin. Stephen has the privilege of being in a position of influence covering over 350,000 people per year. He also has some of the best aviation and STEM toys available in the west of Scotland. In this conversation, he tells us the story of how he got to such a position and how his career and motivation developed to the point it is today. But before we start, I have a request. Please remember to click the like button, share with friends and colleagues, and subscribe. This really does help us get the word out. So, with that in mind, here goes. Good afternoon, Stephen Breslin. Uh, welcome to the Short Circuit Podcast. Uh, very pleased to see you again. It's been a long, long time. And uh, we're going to start with question one in time-honored fashion. And that is, uh, who are you? And in what way are you connected to the world of aviation? And in this case, I'll say the world of STEM and aviation. Okay. Well, delighted to be here, Mike. Thank you. I, I'm Stephen Breslin. I'm currently the, the chief executive of Glasgow Science Centre, but uh, when I was a very much younger man in my teens, I decided I wanted to be an engineer. So I kind of set my heart on a uh, studying for an engineering degree at a very early age, probably 11, 12 years old. Mm -hmm. But an, a lot of that motivation was driven by my passion and interest for aviation. And I took that through my education. So I studied for a, uh, my first degree was mechanical engineering, but then I went back and did a PhD in aircraft flight control system design. All oh, right. And that was with the British Aerospace at the time. So I worked on the, the, the Typhoon a control system with, with British Aerospace, which was very exciting. And also, during that, that period, we had a collaboration with the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base out in Dayton, Ohio. Wow. So I, I was a, really indulging my interests a, at that point. But to, to cut a long story short and fast forwarding to today, I ended up as Chief Executive of the Glasgow Science Centre, and our role is really to stimulate an interest in all things STEM, including aviation, but knowing just how powerful aviation can be as a, a method of engaging young people. We installed a flight academy within the, the Science Centre. Mm -hmm. So we now have a dedicated space with three full motion commercial flight simulators. And we take a uh, young people uh, on a, a full day's experience where we, we, we brief them on the basics of aeronautics. We uh, tell them all about navigation and then we set, uh, set them a search and rescue task. And they have to construct a flight plan and a search plan, uh, which they then take into the simulator and, and fly to try and achieve a, a, a rescue objective. And we have seen firsthand just how powerful an experience that creates for young people. That sounds absolutely fantastic. So my, my first question on a purely personal basis is how young do you have to be to get into this thing? Because I want a shot. <laughs> well, a 11 years old, we kind of, we, we, we can get you in there a wee bit earlier if you've got a, adult supervision and we, we have booster cushions mm -hmm. uh, we can put our younger guests in uh, but someday else we'll have to do the pedals for you right. but, you know, we, we, we can uh, switch control uh, between the, 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 the passenger and, and, and the pilot mm -hmm. but it's, it's a fabulous experience and you know the, the full motion and you're surrounded by screens so it is fully immersive 
and these are commercial simulators. Right. So, yes, for most people, it's just a, a half hour, one hour experience. But if you want to take it all the way, you could do all of your simulator time, uh, and it, you can do instrument landing, uh, poor weather flying, night flying. Wow. Uh, you can throw in a few is here and there, but we've never never really taken it that far. But we do have a uh, groups from a. Uh, University Air Squadrons that, that do use it for their training. Mm -hmm. I mean, that sounds absolutely fascinating. I, I wasn't aware of this facility. Some Somebody mentioned that there was a, there's a simulator at, at the Science Centre. So, oh, yeah, okay. And I was I was thinking it would just be a um, something very simple, but I need to come and ob obviously explore this a bit further myself. So Indeed. Yeah. Okay, well, that, that's fantastic. Thank you very much for that. What got you interested in aviation? How, how did all that kick off i i can't remember when it actually started but I, I, I remember as a young boy so maybe 11 years old i, I lived in central scotland and i would a uh, cycle out to the nearest airport mm -hmm. uh, edinburgh airport edinburgh townhouse airport it was still 20 miles away so that was quite a big big deal mm -hmm. for Old, but I would cycle out there and I would spend the whole day watching aircraft and recording registrations as a, a plane spotters would do. Mm -hmm. I also remember uh, being lucky enough to be taken to the air show at Lookers, RAF Lookers. Mm -hmm. And at that time, my memory of that was watching two F4 Phantoms take off on full afterburner. And it felt that the whole earth was <laughs> shaking. And I remember at that time thinking, I want to know how that works. I need to know how that works. And so that was probably the spark that took me to university. But way before that, I had a cross-section or a poster of a cross-section of a Rolls-Royce RB211 turbofan engine, jet engine, mm -hmm. uh, on my my bedroom wall. <laughs> yeah, the other poster, uh, incidentally, was a, a Bruce Lee poster. But those were, were, were my two passions. Okay. I just want to know how a uh, aircraft work worked, and I, I think it was just the you know that being so impressed by the power, yeah, the power of these machines, you know, <laughs> and it, it was an obsession. It, it was an obsession, and, and to this day, uh, I've still got an unhealthy interest. In, in aircraft that, that takes me to the Royal International Air, Air Tattoo every, every every few years, but mm -hmm. it's never going to work for me. It's I must admit, there's a couple of things you said that um, one anybody who's seen a couple of Phantoms take off at full track, you, you can't fail to be impressed. It's it's an uh, abiding memory with me uh, from my days as a cadet. Um, and the other thing which you just reminded me of. The, you mentioned the RB211. Now, to some people listening, that might sound oh, really geeky and that's very, very specific. But for those of us of a certain age, everybody had heard about this this engine, this new engine, the RB211, because it was on the news. It was on Blue Peter. It was on Panorama and stuff. It was a, a catchphrase. Um, and people were very aware of British aviation and the British aviation industry at that time. Um, I I don't think there's any equivalent to that these days, but that's just me being a grumpy old man moaning. But uh, yeah, different times, but uh, fascinating times. So moving on from how you got started with your aviation passion, how did you get started at the Glasgow Science Centre? Because I can remember the time when before the Science Centre existed. So um, have you been there since the beginning or what? what's the well, story there? That, that is quite a long story. So <laughs> I... I what I did with, with university and the years uh, just following university, I indulged my passions. So between my first degree and my PhD, I worked for a while uh, as an engineering consultant to the Royal Navy. I would go out on uh, submarines with the Navy uh, on exercise and then I would bring the data back and, and reconstruct the, the exercise digitally mm -hmm. uh, based on the, the, the sonar data. So that was me indulging a passion. And then with the PhD, I 
definitely indulge that passion uh, for aviation and, and aircraft technology. But then uh, after about five or six years of that, I, I started to earn a living as a, as a software engineer. Programming computers was uh, one of the skills that I had kind of picked up on along the way. And it was just before, it was late, late 90s. So internet boom and a huge amount of opportunity uh, in that space. So I became a, a professional uh, software engineer for uh, six years or so. Travelled the world with that, mm -hmm. uh, fixing large enterprise systems uh, all over the place and uh, across different sectors. But then I became, I, I joined a, a, a technology startup company as a chief technical officer. The CEO that recruited me was kind of removed from position three months after I joined and I stood up as acting a CEO at that stage with the intention of recruiting into the, you know, another CEO into the post. Mm -hmm. But after three months, they, they said, look, you're doing a good job. The job's yours if, if you want it. So I kind of accepted it, reluctantly accepted it, but it was one of these uh, offers I felt I couldn't refuse. Yeah. So I did that for, for a while. Uh, and still felt quite uncomfortable in the CEO role, but did it quite successfully for five years and then uh, went down to another, took on another CEO role, this time in an education charity uh, down in London called Future Lab Education. And this definitely was a, a complete curveball for me. So I, I was offered the, the job as CEO, uh, it was going into a sector I knew nothing about, but I was strangely attracted to. <laughs> and after turning the job down a number of times, I eventually accepted it. Mm. And it kind of never really looked back from there because I uh, suddenly I found myself working with people who are passionate about education, people who are passionate about developing the potential of young people. And it doesn't take long until you get sucked into that world. No, it's, uh, and it's addictive. It is addictive. You, you find a mission, you find a purpose. You know, I found a new drive and motivation, which mm -hmm. I found incredibly rewarding. But that was in London. Uh, I kind of wanted to get back to Glasgow at some point, and the, the job at the Science Centre came up. And I suddenly I saw the opportunity to bring my newfound passion for education together with my lifelong passion for science and technology. And it seemed to me to make absolutely perfect sense. And uh, from the moment I started at Glasgow Science Centre, which was 12 years ago, I don't think I've ever felt so at home in an organisation and uh, so uh, comfortable uh, in a role. And it really is a fabulous role. You know, I get to indulge all of my interests and, and use my, 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 as I said, my lifelong passion and enthusiasm for science and tech to try and enthuse others and uh, other young people. Um, and there are so many opportunities out there for young people in a highly technical roles that I see our responsibility as, you know, one making young people aware of these opportunities, but two, helping them prepare for them so that kids from any background, any social background, any educational background can access these opportunities. And that's what kind of drives me. It's what drives the team here at the Glasgow Science Centre. And uh, I feel very lucky and very privileged to be here. I must admit, I mean, I've, I've, attended the center for well, many times like i'd said earlier before we started recording i haven't been for a little while since pre-covid sort of thing but um but if we've had visitors coming up adults or adults with children you know quite often we've we've dragged them along and some of them kicking and screaming and the the facility that you have there is uh astounding it, it really does take your breath away and for those people who haven't had a, uh, a scientific or a technical bent previously, even even they get impressed with it. You know, it's, there's so many things going on. 
uh, it's been way ahead of its time. Um, and also going back to something you were saying uh, about getting in, into the passion for teaching uh, young people. I think when you are passionate about something and you can unlock that vision for for young people, it's so satisfying because when when you see somebody else get excited about the thing you're excited about, it's a very satisfying feeling. So uh, yes, I, I think I can I can understand why you've gone down the route that you have because it must make you feel good. It's it's, a... it's fabulous. I've never had a, a job like it, and it's almost daily gratification. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, we we run over the summer. It's a seven day a week operation, and while I'm sitting in my office right now, I, at any point I can just walk out onto the floors. And I can see young people, adults, families enjoying what we do. And they're having fun with contemporary science and technology. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're not here to play games. They're, they're really interested in a, some of the, you know, you know the, the science and technology that, that we've created exhibits yeah. a, a, out of. Do you still have the is, the, is the planetarium still there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. the planetarium is still, and it's one of the the, the biggest a, a attractions. But it's it's mind-boggling, that is. It's, it's uh, yeah, but anybody who goes there, I recommend it. Just take the extra time, go and see the planetarium. But it, it's not all super duper high tech stuff. I and mean, there's, there's a couple of pieces in there where there's the, um, uh, the, the sonic um, lenses where you can whisper at a wall at one end and 25 yards down the road, somebody else can hear you as clear as a day, um, just demonstrating yeah. that sort of thing. It's, I mean, it's everything from the, the absolutely simple to the, the most advanced tech. It's it's a, a great facility. Um, so one that we should, if you get a chance to visit, there's the plug for you. <laughs> we'll go with that. Yeah, fine, thank you. Yeah, yeah, we we try and engage people with you know just, just some simple but fascinating a uh, scientific phenomena, mm -hmm. but we also have a uh, some larger scale exhibits that are themed uh, around certain areas such as energy or or life sciences or or space and space is going to be a much bigger become a much bigger area for us. Especially within Scotland, uh, you know, as we you know, as, as expectations for a, a launch, a, a vertical launch of satellites, uh, grows uh, later this year. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's all happening. And in, in a, a previous episode, we spoke with uh, Ben Jarvis, who's a, a rocketeer, and he had a he's been doing a lot of awful lot of stuff north of the border as well. It, it's I, I think. The future is definitely here. I mean, the, the, the stuff that we talk about and the stuff that you've got on display, when I was a kid, it was all science fiction, and now it's it's science fact. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it's it's uh, impressive. It's very impressive. I've got a question, though. What you have in the Science Centre, you've got some of the history. There's, there's the things that have been developed in the past, and you're looking at very new things. Um, but what do you see coming over the horizon in terms of, uh, sustainability, materials, um, anything from the developing world, AI. Add the filter on that question with what do you see that's coming that is probably applicable to aviation or aerospace? Sustainability is a, the biggest driver a, for, for most industrial sectors right now, especially aerospace. So sustainable aviation fuels, lighter uh, materials even going so far as a uh, electrically powered flight which is still a long way off uh, on it on any on any scale mm -hmm. so those are really big topics and you know even working you know looking at boeing and their investment in scotland and advanced manufacturing uh, facilities that they are developing up in Scotland. It's all about creating a lighter, much more fuel efficient a, engines. Mm -hmm. You know, and over the next 10, 20, 30 years, we really have to create, you know, much more sustainable ways. 
of, of flying. So that's a, a big focus. Mm -hmm. uh, the other big focus, as I mentioned earlier, is space. And we have always, uh, space has always been a big theme in the Glasgow Science Centre and other science centres. But we've, we've kind of always looked at astronauts and NASA and moon landings and shuttle flights, which is very exciting and very engaging. But what we're trying to do now, and if you excuse the, the, the pun, we're trying to bring it a wee bit back down to Earth <laughs> uh, and say, you know, this isn't something that, that just happens in Houston. It's not all about rockets. There's a, a, a big industry that's developing here and especially in the west of Scotland, around satellites, you know, from uh, developing rockets and launch vehicles to spaceports to uh, CubeSats and all of the this, this new capacity that we are putting up into space is sending back more data than we've ever had before. There's more observation on the of the Earth that we've ever had before. So what are we going to do with that? How are we going to use this data and this information to create new solutions to you know some of the biggest challenges that the world faces mm -hmm. you know, around about climate change, biodiversity loss, food scarcity, water scarcity? And that, for me, is really, really exciting. Because you know, not only is, is the, the technology exciting, it's encouraging innovation. So with this data, what can we do with it? And that's kind of the challenge that we're starting to set our young visitors from schools. What are the possibilities, uh, you know, given the access that we now have to, to data that's never been available before? Yeah. I think, with, and the, the other thing that's coming in with, uh, all this data is it's um, it's giving people who um, they might not be hands-on technical type people, but if you have the imagination, you have the information, then you you can let the free thinkers actually figure something out or discover something new. It's data itself becomes a thing to develop. Yeah. So um, I mean, you must get people getting inspired who who come and visit the centre becoming inspired and getting themselves into technical type jobs and, and that sort of thing. Uh, that must be quite a, yeah. a buzz. Yeah, th there's lots of anecdotal evidence that that does in fact happen for, mm. for young people. And a, a young chap, just a few months ago, I was taken, I took him up to see the, the, the simulators mm -hmm. and he was uh, just graduating a, from Glasgow Caledonia University and an engineering degree, he had built his own flight simulator. And he told me that he had come to the Glasgow Science Centre when he was uh, still at school with a friend, and they, they'd gone to the planetarium. Mm -hmm. And I'm not quite sure what they saw in the planetarium, but when they came out, he turned to his friend, and his, his friend turned to him, and they both always said simultaneously, right, we're going to be engineers, that's what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. And they, 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 they both they, they both did become that. So, yes, it, it definitely sparks a, an interest in a lot of young people. And, you know, an awful lot of it is making them aware of the opportunities that are available. Yeah. You know, so there's, there's very little general awareness of the kinds of opportunities and the potential of the space industry, mm -hmm. for instance, within, you know, within the west of Scotland. And you know there are lots of uh, opportunities in aerospace more generally, yeah. with the you know the hub activities down in Presswick for all of the uh, engine repair and, and aircraft maintenance, and then as I mentioned earlier, the uh, advanced manufacturing capability that we have, which has been uh, applied to the the design of high performance uh, and sustainable, uh, more sustainable aero engines, so. Just making young people aware of these local opportunities can sometimes be enough. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you very much for helping us raise awareness through the podcast. I'm just looking at the clock here, and time's travelled on much faster than I thought it would. Um, so 
Uh, we come towards the end of our conversation and we get to the, uh, the, the signature question for the, the Short Circuit podcast. And uh, this is the point where I ask the listeners, if they can, please uh, like, subscribe and share this around um, just to spread the word. And if you know of any young people who might be inspired, just pass it on to them. But we come to the big question of the day. And that is uh, Dr. Stephen Breslin. Um, what is your favorite aircraft and why? Ah, uh, no. <laughs> I have lots, lots of favorite aircraft for different reasons. But you know, this may surprise you because mm. it's not it's not a fast fighter jet, mm -hmm. but it's a C-130 Hercules transporter. Yeah, the reason that that is my favourite aircraft is because I remember uh, building a model of one when I was a young boy and it took me a long, long time uh, to build. But actually, I, I, I finished it and it just looked magnificent. And every time I see a Hercules, and it's a wee bit harder to see them in the, in the UK now, uh, but every time I see a Hercules, my heart my, skips a beat. Mm-hmm. If I can just add another, an F-14 Tomcat is a very, very close second. A close second, but you're only getting one on the board. So on, on our picture board, we will put up the, the C-130. <laughs> uh, and Thank I, you. I can say at the moment that yours will be the second C-130 that's up there. So there's one up, one that's gone up previously. Um, but I must admit, look, just looking at the picture board, the number of fast jet fighters is very, very small. Our, our guests have been much more eclectic and selective than I had anticipated. And we're getting some beautiful aircraft and some very unusual ones. But the C-130 is, is a worthy addition. It's, uh, I must admit, it's one of my favorites. It's just such a useful aircraft. Um, one of our previous guests described it. She, she said she loved the C-130 because it was cute little nose. Uh, which yeah. is <laughs> one of, the, one of the, the best quotes I've had out of this thing. Um, so uh, before we get cut off uh, and so on, I'll say thank you very much for your time today, Stephen. Uh, it's been great talking to you. I will come into the Science Centre at some point soon, and uh, I'll let you know when I'm coming. If, you, if you're around, I'll buy you a cup of coffee. Um, thanks for coming on the, the Short Circuit. It's been great to hear you, and... Uh, all I can say is, in the future, fly safe. Thank you. It's been my pleasure, Mike. Okie dokie. Cheers. So that was Stephen Breslin. As the CEO of Glasgow Science Centre, he's perfectly placed to impress, inform and inspire future generations into the world of STEM in general, and aviation slash aerospace in particular. I find it fascinating to talk with people whose job has become their vocation. Curating such a facility and resource that is available to the public, while hard work, must also provide opportunities for so much fun. So if you're ever in Glasgow, why not drop in and see for yourself? And with that, I'll say thanks for listening and fly safe. You have been listening to The Short Circuit, presented by Mike McLean and sponsored by Swift Aircraft with the hashtag InspiringAviation. This has been a Zoom Spike production.